Welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. We bring to light the unique opportunities brands face in today's e-commerce world. Hey, and welcome to the Buy Box Experts Podcast. This is Eric Stopper. Today's episode is brought to you by Buy Box Experts. Buy Box Experts takes ambitious brands and makes them unbeatable. We've got a team of consultants who will identify key low-hanging fruit for some of your best-selling ASINs on Amazon or your worst selling ASINs, or maybe you don't list all your products on Amazon. I don't know why you wouldn't do that, but um, reach out to us, come and talk to our team, buyboxexperts.com, click on the free analysis button. It's completely free, no strings attached. Um, we, you'll get connected with me or a member of my team. We're looking forward to seeing you. Today, I am pleased to be joined by Jim Wynn, co-founder of Ripple Analytics. It's an Amazon-specific influencer marketing tool that provides a dashboard to affiliates and influencers who then work with brands to create and push content meant to drive Amazon sales. Jim's an enthusiastic tinkerer, a husband, a father, and the founder of a seven-figure business called Kentucky Home Brands that has several brands that you have probably purchased from. Jim, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on. Excited to be here. Um, So lots and lots of questions. The kind of external driving traffic to Amazon business model has, has become a lot more popular in in recent months. And I I just kind of wanted to get a, a flavor for how, how Ripple evolved into what it is right now and where the Genesis was, like what was the main pain that you guys were addressing that got you to where you are today? Yeah. So uh, you mentioned earlier that, you know, I I own and found a few different physical product companies and, um, you know, way in the early days, pre-Ripple, um, we we saw the importance of outside traffic. We saw, you know, we did a few promoted posts with a few bloggers and influencers, and the response was really good. And we could see the impact that our products had with VSR, you know, once the Amazon algorithm saw that outside traffic coming in, it responded really well, but it only lasted, you know, for a day or two until the, the impact of that email blast or whatever, uh, that paid promotion wore off. And so we decided to really double down on that. Like, that was back when, pay-per-click within Amazon was getting just wildly expensive and competitive. So we're looking for other ways to kind of outmaneuver uh, our competition in a few really competitive categories. So we started going out and contacting every single uh, website that came up in the first couple pages of a Google search for our particular product or category of products and, you know, talk to them to get them to, you know, link to our products or to somebody else's and kind of steal that, that SEO real estate. And, And that was really, really effective for us, but just, ungodly time consuming and just laborious. So, you know, over time, uh, as we did more and more of that, we uh, internally kind of built a a platform that enabled us to automate those relationships and keep track of, you know, who sold what and then compensate them for that. And then over over the last couple of years, that eventually evolved uh, through a a small VC round and uh, some some self-funding into what is today Ripple is kind of more of a public facing ad platform where publishers and advertisers, you know, Amazon specific brands can connect and, and drive traffic and revenue. So give me, give me kind of an example of, of the workflow that a brand or a publisher would engage with while using Ripple, right? I, I, I get the idea of, of leveraging uh, the followers that I have for something, but I log into Ripple and what's the, what, what do I do from there? Yeah, so as a publisher, uh, when brands join, they bring their product catalog into the, into the Ripple marketplace. So. Those are, you know, as a brand, you can control what products show in the marketplace and what don't. But um, as a publisher, when, once they log in, they might go to the marketplace and as they are creating new content, let's say, you know, I'm in the, you know, the paleo space and I, I drive a lot of traffic to Amazon. I'm an affiliate, you know, kind of Amazon affiliate uh, based site. And that's where a lot <laughs> of my revenue comes from. You know, I would go log into my Ripple account, go to the marketplace and I can kind of narrow down and say, you know, what collagen or paleo related companies or brands are in the ripple catalog. And so if I'm going to make a, an affiliate link or, um, you know, making a link to a product on Amazon, I can choose just a random product that I find on Amazon and get paid, you know, Amazon's, you know, whatever that affiliate commission is for that category, or I can go into, into the ripple marketplace and work directly with a brand and, you know, make a link to that product instead. And, and once I do that through ripple, ripples tracking any sales that my, my link now makes, I'm still, linking to Amazon, my audience is still going through the same kind of user experience. They're reading content, they're clicking a link, they're on an Amazon page. So nothing changes from the, the reader's perspective, but behind the scenes, Ripple is tracking that link, that click, and we're able to attribute that sale 
of that product to that particular publisher. So now the brand can compensate the publisher for the sales they drove and the, the publisher is making more money because they're able to work directly with that brand instead of kind of getting that passive affiliate income. Now they're able to take control of that, that steering wheel and actually uh, get paid for the amount of impact they have uh, on that Amazon space. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and I'm wondering um, for the brands who already have like a, a, a war chest of emails, mm-hmm. is, is mm-hmm. this something that they can leverage to uh, drive additional traffic? Should they use a different tool? Is Ripple the right fit for them? Because it sounds mm-hmm. like it's for these big publishers to drive traffic for a handful of, of curated products. That's, that's what I'm hearing. Uh, to an extent, we're, we're broadening our catalog. So we have so many publishers in different categories. It's, it's impossible for us to perfectly curate every product, every publisher. So we're expanding that catalog quite a bit. But um, if, you're, if you're a brand and you have your own email list, like, you know, customer list within that brand, then, you know, it would be, it would be reckless not to use that in every way you could. And, you know, it might be um, beneficial to, you know, in the case of Ripple, it's more connecting you as a brand with publishers who already have that, that audience. If you already have that internally in-house as a brand, then Ripple probably wouldn't perform much impact because you already can you know, email those people, send them to Amazon, and you, you know kind of where that traffic is coming from. But if you are not currently leveraging outside traffic for your Amazon brand, you know, other people's traffic, now th- that's where we really come in. Like we are... are purpose in life as a company is to bridge that connection between brands on Amazon and publishers that want to make more money from driving traffic to those brands on Amazon. Go, go ahead. Oh, no, say what, you know, if you think about it, like if you're an off Amazon brand, um, you, there's a lot of levers. There's a lot of tools you can pull, right. Uh, to, to increase your traffic, to build brand awareness, to get more customers. You know, I can go out and find a large affiliate and compensate them to, you know, email and promote my product. I can, you know, do promoted posts, stuff like that. But in the Amazon, Amazon ecosystem, you're so locked in, you have pay-per-click and you're kind of stuck with that because you're so isolated. So what Ripple does is it enables you to use all of those same off Amazon tools that you would typically use to grow your brand. If you were a, a Shopify site or a WooCommerce store, now you can kind of take that same playbook and apply it to your Amazon sales as well. And especially if you're, you know, um, like a channel manager, like a buy box expert or somebody like that, that, you know, might be uh, performance based and you're looking for new tools that haven't been tapped so you can grow, you know, your, your client sales, this fits right into that. Man, I have, I have so many questions. Oh, so, <laughs> um, how, how does a brand make the cut in the curation process? Mm-hmm. How do I become one of these published brands that, that gets to leverage the cool platform? Right. to be in the marketplace. Um, well, the first step is typically to be, uh, to work with an agency like a buy box experts or somebody like that. Um, we try, we, we, there's always exceptions to the rule, but we try not to work one on one. Uh, like, you know, if a brand wants to, you know, contacts us and wants to work with us, like we're super excited, uh, to, to, to do that. But, um, typically, uh, brands that are working with, uh, a channel manager, yeah, they're usually, better at managing their inventory. They're better at all the other uh, Amazon skill sets like pay-per-click and all of that. And um, they just have a lot more support. And so Mm -hmm. those are all things, if it's a larger tier one publisher that drives an enormous amount of Amazon sales, they kind of want to work with somebody that's maybe more robust as a business and working with brands that are inside of a channel manager uh, usually is a better fit. That's a, you know, like I said, there's always exceptions to the rules. We have, we do have individual brands that are just on Ripple because one, they're either super interesting or they're really large and uh, we're always glad to, to work with them. So without, without giving too much of the farm away, I want to, I want to try to pull back the veil a little bit on exactly what happens, right? So I'm, I'm a publisher and I create an article that goes out to an email list, right? That's the first step mm-hmm. in that, in that piece of content, I have inserted links that go to Amazon pages mm-hmm. And then once, once the customer, the viewer, the, e- the, the email recipient touches the link, mm-hmm. right? What is going on, right? You're able to track all this stuff and give them a, a really actionable uh, report of, of how people engaged with that specific email. Mm-hmm. Um, is it a Facebook pixel? Is it something else that you've, that you've been able to create proprietary? Like what's, what's kind of the 
the process once somebody hits the hits the button, hits the link. Oh, that machinery behind the scenes, mm-hmm. yeah. So again, without without giving the farm away, so um, you know what? Once you click that link, we're able. We we use some some uh, tools that are available to us uh, as a, a media partner with within Amazon that you know we're able to you know track how many clicks that link has had. We're able to track uh, how many visits came to that you know to that page, and then how many of those uh, converted. So we're able to look at that conversion rate, and we're able to combine that with a lot of our publishers' data. So they're obviously tracking their own analytics and their own demographic information on who their readers are, who's clicking and, and going uh, to different parts of the site or to different advertisers. So we, we kind of take that, that data, put it together internally through, you know, like you said, a pro- proprietary process. And that gives both the brand reporting on, you know, as they're making sales, who's driving those sales, what was the conversion rate on those sales. On the publisher side, they're able to get a lot more information. You know, what are the best performing um, products? As, you know, as they're linking to products, what are generating them the most revenue? So they can better optimize what products they link to, what content they create, and kind of focus down, you know, from a Pareto's principle, 80-20 approach, you know, where the most bang for their buck is. And that's particularly important now as of this week, you know, with the big uh, change within the Amazon Associates program, you know, there are a lot of affiliates. And some of these people drive an enormous amount of their, their revenue from Amazon's commissions. You know, their, the commissions Amazon's paying them has been cut, you know, half or mm-hmm. more. So that's... Um, that's a problem in their world. You know, one of the existential threats to an Amazon associate or a large publisher that makes money off Amazon affiliate links is like a seller, you're kind of at the mercy of Amazon's ecosystem, right? So it's difficult for them to kind of ha- have that level of control. So again, the pain point we try to solve for both those sellers and the publishers is you're still kind of following the same workflow, right? You're still taking viewers, readers, and sending them to Amazon where they're comfortable buying, where they're familiar, you're not changing much, but now you have a direct relationship with each other within that Amazon ecosystem. So you can work together to increase your revenue. You have more control. So whereas, you know, you might make, you know, one to 5% as an Amazon associate, our brands are typically paying a 15% commission or more to these publishers. So it's an opportunity for them to increase their revenue on the publisher side and have that direct relationship with the brand. So, I'm, I'm wondering as the brand, how can I support the publisher who is pushing out my content? Does it make sense for me to go and, you know, obviously I'm going to post, hey, we were featured in this article, but is there anything else that somebody can do to make the power of a, of a publication more, uh, generate more traffic and more sales for them from the brand's perspective? Mm-hmm. From the brand side, the number of thing you can do is not run out of inventory. So- <laughs> okay. If, uh, if a, a publication is going to link to you, they, they, they want to make money. And typically, if they're on Ripple, they're a type of publication that, that, that dr- drives impact. So if they link to your product and then, you know, you stock out, you know, a few hours later, then that, that's a loss of revenue for them. You know, they start getting complaints from their readers. Hey, you recommended this. This is the featured item or this is the number one item in that, you know, top five things on Amazon this week, you know, in that listicle and people are clicking and they're not able to buy. So that, that's a negative experience for their readers and it's a, a lost revenue opportunity for them. So, and again, that's why we typically try to look, work with brands that are within kind of mm-hmm. a channel manager because that's one of the main questions we get from our larger publishers is are these, are these products you know, of high quality? Are they well managed? Is it a robust like tier one type of company? So if they're already inside a channel manager, it, it, eliminates a lot of those uh, objections up front when it comes to linking to products. And, and I mean, like how much inventory is, is typically needed for the life cycle of one publication, right? If I get one of these big guys to write a banger, how long is that great article actually going to be driving me some, some traffic? Is it mm-hmm. always, uh, is there a pretty clear diminishing marginal return, a, a cliff that everybody hits at some point? Mm-hmm. How's that? That's a super good question. So there, there's two types. So there's kind of that immediate blast. So if it's uh, somebody that, you know, has a, a, a large email list and they might send, you know, bi-weekly emails or something like that, then that's kind of more of a, an initial blast and there's kind of a die off. You'll see over the next, you know, typically like five to seven days, people open their emails and after a week, if they haven't opened it, that's not going to happen. So you mm-hmm. see kind of diminishing returns from that point. So that's a little more like, Immediate impact, lots of volume, you know, reasonably quick dial. The, the flip side is, uh, again, if you were to Google um, 
collagen paleo for, earlier yeah, too, yeah, right? yeah. for paleo athletes, something like that, you know, whatever site. And, and I don't know who that is. I haven't Googled that, but whoever the number one site is for that search result, they probably are getting consistent, stable monthly traffic. So if you were to go to that blog post and they were to change their link from say um, vital proteins to, to your collagen, then, you know, that's consistent monthly sales as people read that content. They're trying to build their lifestyle around the paleo, the paleo approach. You know, they're looking for stuff like that. They go to that, that they do that search result every day, every month. And then there's consistent traffic from that. So that's a little more stable and mm -hmm. it's not as much of an immediate impact uh, once they change their, their link. So some publishers they'll go through if they, they have a, a product that's on Ripple. They've already got content that performs well and generates revenue. They'd much rather generate revenue to a product on Ripple versus not. So a lot of them will go back and optimize. We'll look at what are our top performing blog posts that generate affiliate revenue. Let's swap out some of these links for products that are in Ripple so we can generate more from what we've got. That makes versus, sense. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a little longer, more sustained. And then there's always, you know, creating new content. You know, they're always putting more stuff out there. And so that, that's more of a collaborative relationship. You know, if you as a brand are helping them see how people are using that product in their lifestyle, you're giving them content ideas, and, you know, you're kind of moving that dialogue through the Ripple platform, then that helps them find ways to, again, produce more content for their audience. You know, I would, I would trust a larger publication to be able to craft something that gives me as much SEO exposure as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but do the brands ever get to weigh in and give them little phrases that they know their customers are searching for that they can kind of supplant into the article? Or is that, is it still kind of this divide between, no, the publisher is going to make what they make. You don't have any say over how it's written. Or are they able to like contribute some, some search terms that they think are relevant. Yeah. Yeah. You get a little bit of both, but you know, the ideal and the best performance situation is when there's kind of that collaborative approach, especially if it's more of a kind of a blast type of thing. If they're emailing and dropping very intentional traffic, then you definitely want to collaborate so that you get the, the most out of that experience. But um, you know, sometimes, you know, especially some larger publications, you know, they've got an intern and their job is to come up with four blog posts for that day. So they're just going into the marketplace and they're looking for products. So they may or may not, you know, engage with some dialogue about how to best promote that. They're just taking that and putting it in a, you know, top 10 listicle of, of some kind. But uh, one of the, one of the things we're um, in the process of rolling out within Ripple is kind of more um, uh, brand content. So as a publisher goes to that product or looks at that brand overview page, you know, the brand's able to kind of give some pointers, you know, here's, you know, how people uh, use this in their real, in, in their day-to-day -day life. Here are some key talking points. If you're looking to make content that resonates with an audience and you're wanting to out SEO your competition, here are some points that people who would use this product would, you know, want to know about. So that again, kind of helps that collaborative, more cur curated relationship that we try to nurture inside the, inside the platform. So the, the low hanging fruit seems to be very low, right? You've got these publishers who are trying to make lots of money and the affiliate program at Amazon is weird and volatile because it's Amazon. And so do you guys, do you guys even mess with the, the influencers and in Instagram and TikTok and Snapchat and even LinkedIn? Do you, do you plug into those ecosystems or is it just too high up on the tree? It, um, we're just now starting to tinker with that. A little bit I, there there have been there's been so much opportunity in kind of that email and, and publisher ecosystem that we've really focused on that but we're able to do some uh some, some newer attribution that takes us outside of that environment so we can do more stuff whether it's instagram or tiktok or something like that so it's not a big part of what we do i'm only just not so much because we can't it's just we focus on other things but we're to the point now we can kind of experiment with other channels which has been super super exciting for us yeah do you uh do you use tiktok by chance, man, a, a little bit. All my nieces and nephews do, which mm. makes, makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that old, but uh, a, a little bit. My wife loves TikTok. <laughs> have you Have you done any dances with her? No, not yet. I'm not <laughs> to that point to yet. Uh, no, <laughs> tonight, so, tonight we'll do the the first. Yeah, TikTok. it's like the new Twitter. You know, you can pretty much get <laughs> away is. with whatever. Yeah. I do know. Uh, I have a friend of a friend who. He got on TikTok like in the early days and he's like a TikTok influencer. So he has like a couple hundred thousand followers. And, you know, when his kids want some extra money, he'll say, hey, here, take the phone, go live for a little bit. And they'll go live on TikTok and you know, <laughs> make 50 bucks. Or it's just bizarre. You know, and it's so. it's really strange to me. You're, you know, you're in this influencer and, and affiliate space. 
Um, I'm trying to figure out how, how like a TikTok would really monetize. I've noticed that there are a few more ads here and there. The influencers that have tens of millions of followers, there's one guy, he has 2.1 billion views on one video. Wow. Right. He's this, uh, he's this guy that does like deep fakes and he, uh, oh, yeah. Like yeah, animation. yeah. I'm trying to remember his name, but, um, I don't oh, see, I don't see monetization. He, he doesn't look like an advertiser to me. I, d I don't, I'm looking at the brands of his clothing, right? And it looks to me like he's not leveraging his reach mm -hmm. the way that I probably would as, as a greedy marketer. <laughs> and so I'm wondering like, what's, what's going to be the tipping point in TikTok? When are these influencers actually going to start being able to monetize these interactions that they're having with these people? Yeah, it'd be interesting. I, you know, on my end, it's, it, I had just to be super honest, man, I have no idea. I'm, I'm really excited to see how that, I feel like it's, it's big enough now that you start to see some of those use cases bubble up. So it'll be really yeah. interesting over the next six months. But I'm, we'll I'm tracking, tracking it closely because <laughs> I mean, even for like artists, right? It's becoming a, it's becoming a channel for them to advertise their music through. And yeah. you see some of the top hits are becoming these, these main TikTok grabs that people are using. Yeah. Um, sure. So I, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about um, the celebrity stores and the editorial recommendations that, that Amazon has been leveraging as of late. Mm -hmm. um, they're, not, they're not causing me to make more purchases, but that's because I'm, I'm probably subjecting them to a bunch of scrutiny. Mm -hmm. um, do, you guys, do you guys work with these, these stores and these, these types of publications? And then how does that work? And how difficult is it to get one of these kinds of things set up for an for a influencer in this space on Amazon? Yeah. The, the celebrity stores have been like, we know some people that, that are using it and it hasn't been a huge success for them. And um, I, I think again, cause it's just kind of a clunky experience just as a, a as a user. It just doesn't, it is usually not consistent with the workflow of like, I read this piece of content, I click this link to, you know, find this product that helped my lifestyle and I, boom, I end up in this giant catalog of like, you know, yeah. And, Chris, and like, hey, Chris right. Pat Pratt's underwear. Right. right yeah. Right. Right. It's just kind of, it's just kind of wonky. So, uh, you know, I think that'll probably evolve and get better over time. But I think that the, from the people that we work with within ripple, the, the experience has been, you know, just kind of underwhelming for the most part. Um, the, uh, the, the flip side are like the editorial recommendations that that's super interesting. And for some of the larger publishers we work with that are some of those editorial uh, recommendations that you see, it's a huge, huge focus for them. Like some of them have teams of people focused on just that. Wow. And so it's, uh, um, you know, just uh, what I think a lot of people, especially on the brand side, don't realize is how much, how important a part of the revenue stream uh, Amazon, the Amazon Associates program is for for publishers, both small, medium blogs and larger publishers that you know you read both. You know whether it's in print or you know just a larger, just digital first type of magazine. Uh, it's it's an enormous part of their focus, and they have teams and teams of people devoted to that. And so um, that that that'll probably become a much bigger part of the ecosystem. And if I was a brand, I would be laser focused on figuring out how to have my brand be part of those recommendations, build a relationship with those publications because it's, it's a big part of the future, I think. Yeah. What, um, what would you encourage everybody to do today mm -hmm. to increase the odds of, of their chance of getting into one of these editorial recommendation posts? Um, right now it's, uh, it, it's, kind of a, a, a from the brand side it's a matter of luck you know a lot of these are larger publications that are reviewing products and have huge outside audiences that that people you know people trust their recommendations so you know the ba basic building blocks are have a really good high quality product with lots of reviews and you know as close you know you know four or five stars if you're a three-star product with 30 reviews like you're just not going to make the cut and um, you know, one, probably not the right fit for Ripple, but also you're, you're not going to be picked up by one of these larger, you know, kind of editorial reviews, you know, type of, type of sites. Um, so just kind of that brand legitimacy. And again, that's why we typically work with kind of brands in a, a, a channel manager uh, capacity. Um, that, that makes a lot of sense. So if, yeah. you, if you're struggling to look big, a really easy thing for you to do would be to sign on 
Amazon management with, and I'm not saying you have to do it with us, but with like one of these partner agencies who can open these doors for you. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, hundred percent. And you know, typically the brands we know that are within kind of a, a an agency, uh, their listing pictures are better. They're on Amazon SEO is better. The reviews mm. are better. The that they are is higher. So, you know, we have one particular group of publications that, that, is, is enormous. And, you know, unless you're what they call a tier one brand, like they, they are not going to link to your product, whether it's an intern making a list of the top five kitchen gadgets of the month or in a larger, more promoted, you know, focused capacity, like they are not going to link to your product. So, you know, you need to have the basics, right? You need, um, uh, the expanded, uh, seller page with the, you know, the pictures and, you know, box of text. If you just got the standard generic, uh, block a text or the description, you know, that's, they're not going to like that. Right. Yeah. There's paid. nothing wrong with that. If you, if you don't have, uh, um, enhanced brand content, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but you're probably not the right fit for some of these larger publications. There, there are some pretty clear filtering criteria that they use. What, what are some of the other ones for like, for me to be considered a tier one brand, mm-hmm. certain amount of volume, certain amount of reviews, certain amount of like emotion that I feel when I hear the name of your product? Like how do they measure yeah. these kinds of things? For, for the larger publications uh, in, in their world, tier one is a product that you're going to find at Walmart, Target, you know, Walgreens, like major retail. So mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a brand that you're really familiar with on a, on a national level. But, you know, going down from there, uh, you know, not, that, that, that's it's a long way before most brands get to that point, right? But, you know, if you're not to that point, you know, again, the, the, the base, you just have to have the basics, solid reviews, solid presentation, good inventory management, and uh, just, you know, kind of have your operation very buttoned up. And again, channel managers seem to do that well for a lot of our brands. So, so you listening, you've got your checklist, get, get to building, come and talk with us. Let's see what we can do. If you've got a product that should be in Walmart and it's not, why isn't it in Walmart? right? Why isn't it in there? Uh, if it's not in target, why isn't it there? What do you have to do to get there? Uh, there's some, there's some, I mean, you, you've all played video, video games, right? There are very clear quests that you have to complete before you get to the boss. And so go out and, <laughs> and, a good way to put it. and go and grind, right? You got it. You got to grind from level one and it takes a while to get to level hundred. And so you've, you've got your checklist. So um, Jim, I, I want to hear about the successes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, what do we see when we use Ripple? Obviously, the publishers are making more money, um, but does a brand care about the publisher? You know, maybe when they're making them some money, but it's mm-hmm. kind of a chicken and the egg thing. So what kind of success do people see using the, the Ripple analytics tool? Yeah, well, from a, from a brand side, the, um, the, the, the number one impact is, is honestly more organic, right? So, um, when we were talking uh, earlier, you, you used the word anointing, and that's a good way to phrase it, right? So when you have outside traffic coming into your listing, Amazon's algorithm anoints you with just exponentially better rank. And you know, once you're ranking better, you're getting more organic sales. So just overall, just we look at kind of just across uh, all the sales, all the metrics that we track, typically we see a 20 to 30% increase in organic sales for every outside traffic sale that Ripple brings in. A 20 to 30% increase in organic sales. Correct. For the traffic that Ripple brings to your Amazon. Correct. Holy Correct. smokes. Correct. Yeah, that's that's anointing if I've ever heard of it. The, <laughs> the basic idea here being that, of course, Amazon is going to, to benefit the folks that are driving external traffic to them. Mm-hmm. But what you're talking about is I mean, that's category changing, right? Like you could, you could move from the second to first or from the 30th to the sixth position in a, in a rank with that kind of organic growth. Is that what you're seeing with, with folks using these tools? Yeah, on a consistent basis. Now, it, it kind of relates to, you know, volume as well, right? So if you're in a competitive space and you have a, you know, smaller mom and pop blog linked to your product, you know, that might move two or three, you know, units a day or something like that, or, you know, a week depending you know, on size. So that's not going to suddenly skyrocket you to page one on, mm-hmm. you know, search results for, you know, paleo collagen. But, um, you know, if you start putting together more and more of those smaller to medium sites, whether again, you go out and just recruit them yourselves and you're trying to build traffic in DIY style or using Ripple to kind of do that at scale, um, 
now that that you know trickle becomes a consistent wave day after day or if you're working with a larger publisher now there's a tidal wave that hits that listing all at once and it's not it's not rigged right we're not doing a giant like 99 percent off giveaway blast and we'll sell 500 units in an hour you know 100 percent you know off or something like that these are right. full price sales which amazon likes it's outside traffic which amazon likes and especially if it's somebody with you know well-established SEO content, it's consistent traffic over and over. You know, again, that's a little bit different than if you kind of do a, a, a promoted like email blast type of thing. But um, that that's the kind of formula Amazon likes. And when you, you do that well, and it's natural, and it's organic, and it's honest and authentic, then the algorithm naturally is going to respond well to that. And it makes sense. I mean, Amazon knows that BuzzFeed exists, right? Right. sites like that and you know they they know their data they know people read that click on things and buy it so they're naturally geared to have you know the algorithm and and i don't know the details of the algorithm but we we see listings respond well to outside traffic and if you really think about kind of the the ecosystem of it makes a lot of like, sense yeah it totally makes sense i mean it'd be weird for it not to react that way I mean, the, the, the name of the brand gives away the idea right like that you're you're going to cause a ripple effect mm-hmm for your brand if you do it right and it's going to organically grow you. Um, I, I think that the offer is really compelling. So how do, uh, how do people get in touch? How do, how do people get involved or yeah. should I send everybody? Uh, Ripple, R P P L E. We dropped the E because we're techie and fancy. So rippleanalytics.com. That, that's our site. And once you're there, uh, you can kind of self-select if you're a, a, an influencer publication or a seller, and you can click the button. It'll give you more detail kind of just about who we are, how we work for your particular situation. And then there's a contact form at the bottom. You can kind of fill out a little bit of your info and uh, you know, that usually goes to, to me or one of our co-founders and we kind of carry the conversation on with you from there, whether you're a publisher or a brand. Excellent. Ripple Analytics, R-P-P-L-E analytics.com. Go and check it out. Jim, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was a blast. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to the Buy Box Experts podcast. Be sure to click subscribe, check us out on the web, and we'll see you next time.